How's it going, everybody? Brian Albers and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio. It is March 7, 2024, figure 4, online.com, slash wrestlingobserver.com. we got a lot of news to get into here today. And uh, we start off with another horrible pro wrestling story. Daniel Rodimer, who was a former Tough I, Enough I you contestant. Gonna, I, I thought you were going to like tell me something about like the announcing or something. No, this is, a, this is terrible. It's actually a legitimate terrible story. Okay. Uh, Daniel Rodimer wrestled uh, as Dan Rodman on some house shows, some episodes of Heat. Uh, Stephanie McMahon was very high on him at the time. Big, blonde. Well, Big. he uh, wanted for murder, turned himself in, arrest warrant, and uh, is wanted in relation to the homicide of a 47-year-old Christopher Tapp. Resorts World Las Vegas, October 29, 2023. Tap's cause of death, blunt force trauma to the head. He took L.A. Knight's move? I don't know. This is not good, dude. No. Well, you know, actually, no, I know. It's a very serious story. Um, Daniel Rodimer, um, you know, I mean, he, he almost got elected to the House of Representatives. Um, and uh, he, his, he actually became kind of infamous. Um, he, he ran, for, he ran in, in Vegas and lost the election. Um, one of the reasons he probably lost the election was because right before the election, it came out that there were a series of um, you know, assault charges against him that were all ended up being dropped, but, but he'd had several in Florida and a couple in Vegas, including two with uh, involving his girlfriend and his wife. Well, that certainly looks a lot different now. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, there were several charges um, over the years for him. Um, you probably remember him from uh, Tough Enough, which we'll get into in a second. But um, yeah, so he there was a party um, at the Resorts World on that night, and the story is originally when Christopher Todd, who who was um, very interesting character himself, um, but um, because he was Tap, Christopher Tap. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was he was. Um, he was on like NBC Dateline a couple times. He had been arrested, and he'd spent over twenty years in prison for the murder of someone who, in fact, he never murdered. And it was one of those things where um, he ended up getting um, eleven point two million dollars when he sued the the city of Idaho Falls. You know, for you know, basically, um, you know, him him being for, falsely imprisoned. You know, D, the DNA evidence to show that that he did not do it and they found the guy who did it many many years later um he was he was basically coerced into a confession and um I mean, he's a pretty major guy he's, he's actually gone and gotten um he got laws passed in oregon and in idaho about um you know the government re you know basically paying people restitution that were falsely imprisoned you know for you know like sixty two thousand dollars for a year for um you know, each year that they were imprisoned in Idaho, and I think Oregon's got a similar law. He he done that in just the the past couple of um, years. He'd been working on that since his release from prison, um, and when he was um you know basically exonerated, and um, he was he had done an interview for Nightline talking about this whole situation, and then you know like two months later or so, it was in August, and then in October, he's at this party. And allegedly, the story is is that the original story was that they thought he had fallen and hit his head, um, and um, died from the the you know blood force trauma. But um, later, it, it the um, investigation showed that uh, he probably was murdered. Um, basically, when the coroner saw the body, said it was consistent with a homicide. So to investigate, it's a homicide. And what they found out was that there was um, a party in the room that uh, in, in the hotel room that uh, Daniel Rodimer was there and um, Christopher uh, Tapp was there and many other people were there. There were so there, there were basically witnesses. And as the story goes, um, Tapp offered it was a lot of cocaine at the party and Tapp offered cocaine to. Uh, the stepdaughter of Daniel Rodimer, and Daniel Rodimer lost his cool, and it ended up being a big, uh, a big fight. He basically punched him. The guy hit his head um, on a table. 
uh, fell down, and Rodimer kept punching him, and, and he later was in a coma and, and eventually died. And they actually had seized a cell phone from um, Daniel Rodimer's wife. And um, let me just get the thing where um, she basically, you know, in the cell phone records, um, you know, said that, um, so he was, he was, he was, uh, he turned himself in later tonight, um, earlier tonight, I should say, and he was released on a uh, $200,000 in $200,000 bond. And, um, so Tap had, um, had gotten 1.2 million for false imprisonment. And then he filed a suit and he got $11.7 million in the lawsuit, um, stemming from the case where, um, he was, uh, you know, convicted and, um, they almost got the death penalty on him. And, um, you know, but, um, you know, he was spent, like I said, he spent all that time in prison and then, uh, found out that the guy, um, you know, he was accused of both rape and murder of, uh, an 18 year old girl. Um, and this is when he, you know, obviously he was about 20 and it was a girl who was part of a group that he and his friends would hang out with. And, um, so anyway, that's what, that's what happened there. And then, um. There were, um, let me just see if I have the uh, notes as far as what the, um, yeah, so so um, his wife basically, um, uh, this is Daniel Rodimer's wife, um, uh, wrote, or basically on the cell, they found cell phone records where she basically said that, uh, you know, I almost saw you, um, you know, kill someone and I had to pull you off, so... You know, that was kind of um, some of the evidence. And there were other witnesses who basically said that. Um, so, um, yeah, Rodimer was um, hes probably best well-known for, um, as far as the national basis, as far as the wrestling goes. I mean, he came in, he was like 6'6", 280, looked like, um, this is an old name um, who was very famous in the 60s. Um, guy was in some movies and bodybuilding. He was all over the bodybuilding magazine. He's named Dave Draper with a big blonde hair, big, you know, guy like that who was, uh, from this area actually lived here for years and years and years. But, um, he was on, there was a season with the Miz. It was a season with Ryback. It was a season with Daniel, the Daniel Pruder one. And he was one of the finalists on that season. And, um, they liked him. You know, they saw the look and everything like that, the size, the blonde hair, the Draper look. You know, obviously, they they liked him, and he was offered a developmental deal, and he turned it down because he said he was making $200,000 a year in uh, Florida selling real estate, and, you know, he wasn't going to come in for 50000 So about a year went, and they came back to him, and they offered him a very big deal to come to developmental. So that's how high they were on him. I don't know if it was quite as high as 200000 but it was much higher than the usual developmental deal. And he was down there for a while, and um, right when he was about to be, you know, right when he was about to be called up, um, Stephanie McMahon was head of creative at the time, and when he was about to be called up, he um, quit. You know, and, and, and the role he was, was uh, he was going to be the third member of Team RKO with Edge and Randy Orton, so that's a plum spot, to say the least. You know, he was going to be the, th the third guy in their group, and that was a main event group, if you remember at the time, um, team rated RKO. So, um, but he quit right before he was about to be called up because, uh, you know, he basically felt that he could uh, do more with his life than be a pro wrestler. He went to law school, uh, graduated law school, and um, ended up in Vegas, ran for office there, lost the race. Then he went to Texas the next year. He had and basically ran for a vacant seat and he did did you ever you remember the tv ads that he did i did not see any of them oh my god his tv ads i mean they were all over the place because it was i so remember comical. you talking about them at the time yeah 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 i mean they were all over the place they were on like uh, tv shows because they looked like some a saturday night's um live saturday night live tv ad like mock of a television ad because he's out there and he's talking in this texas twang even though he was from new jersey and never talked like that before and, you know, talked about how he was going to kick Nancy Pelosi's butt and how he was a pro wrestler and he was a bull rider, which he was a pro wrestler for a little while. He was never a bull rider. And they had this thing of him like riding a bull in this commercial that was all, you know, completely staged. You know what I mean? And um, <clears throat> but, yeah, it was on. Um, he claimed that uh, Trump endorsed him and Trump did endorse him for the Vegas seat that uh, 
that he didn't win, um, but he didn't endorse him for the Texas seat. And it ended up in the Texas seat, he got like 2.6% of the vote. You know I mean? He was, you know, beaten horribly. And um, I don't believe he's run for office since. But, um, yeah, I mean, that's why it got a lot of play, pl- press play in uh, Vegas, because, you know, he had run and nearly had won, had, had won election into uh, Congress in Vegas. So it's like a former candidate for the Congress for House of Representatives was arrested for murder today. So um, that's how he came up. And, um, yeah, Christopher Tabb, um, very interesting personality and story as well. So, um, you know, as far as what's going to happen, um, you know, who knows? But it's, it's the evidence is, is uh, pretty incriminating, um, you know, especially with the wife's cell phone, um, you know, cell phone statement, essentially, about watching him pound this guy and having to pull him off and uh you know so um and yeah like i said he had he had several arrests over the years for assault but no convictions well we've got a bunch of fallout from the pay-per-view on sunday including we'll talk about dynamite later on but okada has signed with aw debuted on the show as a heel as a heel he's a member of the elite with the young bucks Yep, yeah, gonna go against Eddie Kingston most likely on the pay per view. Yeah, it's looking the, like a hell of a pay per view. We'll say. Oh that. my God, Brian Danielson against Will Ospreay, which is I don't know 100 percent on the pay per view, but it's like 95 percent. Okay, what I know for sure, 100 percent for sure, that match is happening relatively soon. Okay, I have been told that it's something that uh, Tony Khan has been wanting. You know, that's like the dream match of all dream matches, probably for him. But this match is happening, I pre- I presume it's going to be on the St. Louis pay-per-view on April 20, 20, uh, 21st. And um, Eddie Kingston and Okada and Swerve and Joe. And probably the finals of the tag team title tournament, too. So, yeah, um, looking like a hell of a pay-per-view. So what did the show do? At least what do we know the show did on Sunday? I mean, it looks good. Um Right now, it's uh, 25% up from World's End when it comes to domestic streaming on BR. Um, 21% up on television um, as of today. And, you know, I'll get more updated numbers tomorrow, but that's as as of today. And then um, the international um, through Triller was not up as much as the domestic for whatever reason. But, yeah, it's looking like... uh, it it will be probably the third or fourth biggest in company history. You know, the biggest, of course, was, um, um, you know, the punk um, debut at All Out 2021. The second biggest was All In in last year from Wembley. The third biggest was a show, it was the Revolution show from two years ago, which was um, Adam Page against Adam Cole, MJF against CM Punk, and um, I think... Uh, um, God, what was the other one? Uh, the, there was another big one on it. Um, Jericho and um, no, no, Jericho and MJF was the other year, but um, there was um, God, I don't even have it in front of me, but um, but those were like the the, the um, I think it was Brian Danielson and Moxley actually was the match, I believe. So um, yeah, so that one ended up at one seventy five. Um, this one, um, it's possible. You know, again, you know, depending on late buys. And I mean, the whole key always is always late buys because, um, you know, based on word of mouth and things like that, you know, we'll see. It could beat that. It could fall short of that. But it but it looks like it's going to be third or fourth biggest of all time. And then the uh, the merchandise at the show was uh, the biggest for any AEW show in history, except for Wembley, um, like 22 bucks ahead. Twenty-one eighty-four ahead, something like that. Ridiculously high numbers. So, um, and mostly Sting merchandise, and um, the concession numbers. Um, you know, as far as food and drink purchases in the building, were incredibly high for the building. The building basically, it, it actually reminded me of um, the story from. Um, and this has got to be the mid seventies when they had this really long show at the Coliseum. It was a U.S. title tournament that uh, came down. I think. I think Terry Funk beat Paul Jones in the finals, but um, they had set all this food and drink records 
because the show was so long. And then this one, we had a five-hour show. So, yeah, the food and drink purchases were incredibly high when people are sitting there for a five-hour show. So um, it was an extremely um, successful night for the Coliseum. Um, extremely successful night for AEW as well. You know, it's amazing when you look at the pay-per-view business, the pay-per-view buys, the pay-per-view attendance, the pay-per-view biz. I mean, everything. And then we got Collision tomorrow. Yeah. As of three days ago, 1,400 tickets. Yeah, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. I know. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't see the number. It looked like a couple. It looked like they probably had three thousand or more tonight, though. It was. Um, what was it? I don't know what the final number was, but it was. Uh, as of this morning, they were at. Uh, yeah, twenty nine fifty eight. So probably about thirty one hundred or so. I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Somewhere in that range. Yeah. Man, fourteen hundred for Collision. Yeah, it's a great show too. Well, it is now, but I think the key that we've been talking about forever but, is but there, there was no card until today. There were no matches announced. There's no card until today. If and you're you not were gonna, in the area, no matches announced until tonight. I, I know people who would have gone to the show today had they known this card, but they didn't know anything until... when Because, you know, I didn't know anything until today. I wasn't really paying close attention because I was so busy writing about, uh, basically about revolution and writing about... Um, you know Paul Heyman and everything like that in Bull Bull Nakano. Bull Nakano. We should talk about her too. Well, but, I can uh, I can tell you this: as of three Eastern today, when I did Observer Live, there were two matches and an interview segment announced, and that yeah. was it. The Rio match was announced, and the Osprey match was announced. And the Osprey match just came together at the last minute. Yeah, or or, or not the last minute, but that was three Eastern today. Yeah, 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 yeah. The Osprey match was was cleared. Well, they they. Osprey was cleared, I believe, either this morning or last or or yesterday. But it was a very late clearance. It was with it was it was less than twenty four hours before match time. And then yeah, Riho and Statlander who had a hell of a match. That's probably the best AEW women's match in a long time. And then the frickin' Osprey Fletcher match. My God, that's one of the best matches in the history of that show. That match was freaking incredible. Well Osprey's just on he's just different. I don't even know what to say about him now. I mean it's like Last year he was unbelievable, and this year he's like way better than he was last year. Um, I remember when Okada told it was actually Mark Ramonde. It wasn't me, but it was um, he had done an interview with me, and then he did one with Mark Ramonde, and he told Mark Ramonde that this is this is dating back. It would would, would have been, I believe, the second time uh, New Japan came to Long Beach because I didn't go to the first one because of um, you know the weekend. Those other week. my father actually died that week that the, that day but um the, so i we went to the second show and we talked to um okada for a while and then um mark ramonde um who was with uh espn he also spoke to okada and okada told him that will osprey you know will be the best wrestler in the world by the time he's 30 which he is and he is he is 30 right now but I don't think anyone realized how good he was. I just heard from Flair. Flair just couldn't even... Flair, you know, that's the first time Flair had ever seen him. And um, he'd heard of him, but he'd never seen him. And I heard Flair and Steamboat just thought that this guy was like, you know, nothing that they had ever seen before. And uh, boy, he was... If he was 70% tonight against Kyle Fletcher, boy, did Kyle Fletcher look great tonight. Yeah, the only other thing I would say about uh, all of this is next week is expected to be the debut of Mercedes. Yeah. And, I mean, they didn't they didn't and tell you tonight. They sure didn't. They did not tell you tonight. They didn't even say there was a big debut. They just said it's big business. They just said big business. They didn't even say that there's a major debut. They didn't, you know, they had, they had Wardlow and Samoa Joe are going to wrestle for the championship on the show. And then uh, Jay White and Darby Allen. So at least we got some stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like they had like nothing because I remember in the afternoon today I saw that the Young Bucks were going to do that, and it's like that one, the Young Bucks segment with Okada, that has been known for not by me, but it's been known by the Young Bucks and Okada and Tony Khan for for literally months. I mean, like when or not? I mean, it was Tony Khan's idea to do this a long time ago. You know, like it was the the show after Revolution. I mean, this is not something like they could have advertised like a big surprise 
from the Young Bucks will announce a big surprise next week. They could have announced it for like weeks ahead to build the show. Um, they announced it the day of the show. So it's like, yeah, that's one of the reasons why attendance is not uh, that great because they don't announce anything. I don't even know how, like, I guess we'll find out how the TV does. I'm sh- I am I would suspect it'll do about the same it's been doing. But if it doesn't, it's like, you know, I mean, this was a, this was a, a great television show. But, um, yeah, I like, didn't know hardly anything until today. All right, before we get into all of the TV reports, we got to talk about more news. New Japan Anniversary Show. Jack Perry has joined the House of Torture. That's torture. Beat Shooter. Yeah, he beat him uh, in 12-20 with a running knee, so he um, advances to round two of the New Japan Cup. And they had three cup matches. Toriyano beat Yujiro Takashi by a count out. Yoshihashi beat Kenta. Jack Perry beat Shota. <coughs> and... Um, I didn't hear raves about that match, but I'll have to watch that later. And then uh, Tetsuya Naito beat Sho in the heavyweight versus junior heavyweight champions match. And I heard that match was pretty good. And they did have a, a, a pretty much sellout crowd. So that was good. And, um, yeah, that's the deal. So uh, more tournament matches uh, tomorrow. And we've got the uh, El Homenage coming up for CMLL. Yeah, on the 29th. Yeah, that show's going to be a sellout. It's, if, it's, if I think it's, it's already sold out. Um, it might be. It, it, I know that the last time I heard, which was yesterday, there were a few tickets left. So it might have been. It might be sold out now. Yeah. All right. Uh, take us through these ratings. Uh, let me get the ratings out. Okay, so... Um, so for last week, SmackDown ended up I believe uh, fourth for the week on network television, um, and if if they had not put Rock on first, it would have been third. Um, it was behind um, the biggest show was uh, uh, Lakers and uh, Denver Nuggets game, which did 0.79, and then the Warriors and Boston Celtics game, which is an afternoon game on Sunday. The Lakers game was Saturday night game. Uh, the Warriors game um, was a Sunday afternoon game that did 0.70, and then NASCAR race did 0.64. So um, and and uh, SmackDown also did that. Um, so on cable, Raw was first. AEW Dynamite was eleventh. Um, you know the only things that uh, beat AEW Dynamite besides Raw were um, Vanderpump Rules and. Um, 90 Day Fiance Tell All and seven NBA games. So it beat everything else. And then, so for entertainment, Raw was first, 90 Day Fiance second, um, Banner Pump Rules third, AEW Dynamite fourth, and NXT was 15th among original programming. It's probably much lower, much lower if you include the, re- the reruns, but I don't have all the rerun stuff in yet. Um, I did not get don't do not have the NXT number for today. Have you seen it? A rating? Yeah, I haven't seen it yet. Yep, I have not either. Um, Raw on Monday did a the lowest number since the NFL season ended. Uh, surprisingly low, I guess, considering what they've been doing one million six hundred forty nine thousand and an zero point five four. I mean, it's still a good number. Um, in eighteen to forty nine, it's still well above what they were doing at this time last year. But in total viewers, they're well down from last year. Um, Raw was first on cable. Um, you know, the only thing close was a uh, college basketball game, Duke and NC State, um, which did 0.37. And, um, yeah, so um, there was a couple of entertainment shows, um, 90 Day Single Life and um, Below Deck, I believe. But they were way, way behind. Um, the only show on TV that beat Raw was The Bachelor on ABC, and if you actually like look at you know the rating based on homes itself, which is how rating should be done and used to be done, Raw would have beaten that as well. I mean, as far as an eighteen to forty nine, because uh, Raw was the legitimate Raw uh, eighteen to forty nine number was one point one three, and the legitimate Bachelor number was zero point six seven. So it's actually a pretty uh, or 0.97, I'm sorry, 0.97. So it's still a pretty big lead by Raw overall in 18 to 49s. 
Um, very heavily male um, audience for Raw. And um, as far as the high point of the show, um, second quarter, um, as, as far as uh, 18 to 49s, um, which was the Cody Rhodes, Seth Rollins interview. And, um, you know, that was pretty much it. Um, you know, they had the third hour drop. Not anything else un- alarming. I mean, it was just, it was just down. Um, biography on Sergeant Slaughter, 276,000 viewers, 0.07. That might be the lowest they've ever done. That's a very low number. And then the um, Rivals with Jake Roberts and Randy Savage was 316,000 viewers and 0.06, which is also very low and both well down from the previous week. And then Collision on Saturday did 455,000 viewers and an 0.13. And, um, you know, I mean, it's 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 back up exactly as you expected with no WWE pay-per-view on the same day. Of course, it got hurt by the WWE pay-per-view, even though the WWE pay-per-view was in the early morning. You know, it's it's just, you can just count on, if they're head-to-head, it's a killer. And if they're not head-to-head, but it's the same day, it's still going to hurt, um, you know, pretty consistent 22%, you know, hit on um, the collision number. So uh, Collision was 10th for Cable, but head-to-head, as far as that night goes, on Cable itself, um, they were behind only the Tennessee-Alabama College basketball game. They were in second place in the time slot. So that's actually really good. I mean, they had a lot of um, – there's a lot of network programming. There's the NBA game, um, the Lakers-Nuggets, which was the number one rated show of the week on television anyway. And then uh, um, there was a – big soccer game on Univision. Um, so, you know, college basketball was on Fox. And uh, that was that. The, um, the What was the strongest point? Um, the high point in 18 to 49 was actually the first part of the main event. Brian Cage, Roderick Strong, Christian Cage, and Kill Switch against Orange Cassidy, Trent Beretta, Daniel Garcia, and Hook. Um Although that did, um, let me see, if, I think it did, it did the um, the second lowest quarter when it comes to total viewers, but it was the high point in 18 to 49. Um, the high point of the show itself with total, with um, viewers, I believe, was uh, the Mark Briscoe angle with House of Black. So um, setting up the stuff for uh, this week's collision because it's Mark Briscoe, Jay Lethal, and Jeff Jarrett against the House of Black as one of the main matches, and um, yeah. So Buldakano is the next inductee into the WWE Hall of Fame, so it's her and Paul Heyman at this point, and uh, they're making announcements rapidly at this point. Well, they, they started Two late. over the past week. Started late in the game. Well, I mean, Buldakano Bull, only wrestled in the WWE for a couple months. Um, she was fired after failing a cocaine test. I think she only had three television matches, probably two of the three, if not all three, against Medusa. One of which, there was one TV match with Bull Nakano and Medusa that was really great. And the other ones were okay. Um, but one was, was a pretty hot match. But Bull Nakano is one of the greatest women wrestlers um, of all time. I mean, as far as her Japan work from, uh, you know, she transcended from the uh, Crush Gals era to the Minami Toyota era, Kira Hokuto era. Um and she was like, between eras, she was like the number one star. But this was a down period when she was number one. And then uh, her match with Asha Kong is considered one of the greatest women's matches of all time, which uh, featured her going. Do you ever see the clip of her jumping off the, the top of the cage? The leg drop? The leg, the leg drop off the top of the cage where she yes. bounced. Yeah, and her back was freaking. That did a number on her. You I remember. Say. Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I mean, she was one of those people who, I mean, she was like Terry Funk. I mean, she would be backstage, and, I mean, her body was just thrashed. They'd have people walk on her back, I mean, um, to, to get her loosened up, and then, boom, she'd come out there and do, like, incredible matches, like, just incredible. Um, uh, but, but you know, she was, she was definitely hurting in her early 20s. In the early mid twenties, which is why her career didn't really go very long, um, and she didn't do a lot of comebacks afterwards either. Um, she ended up dropping a lot of weight, 
Um, she was a professional golfer, actually, after yeah. getting out of pro wrestling. But um, awesome, awesome wrestler. You know, um, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like one of the best. Like uh, female Jumbo, Jumbo Saruta was kind of like kind of what people considered her. And Jumbo Saruta was, was one of the best Japanese wrestlers ever as well. Um, but, uh, yeah, marketable, um, great, great heel look. You know, she was the understudy to dump Matsumoto during the Crush Girls era, Crush Gals era, and then um, world champion for, for a long time. And, um, I, you know, yeah, I just remember at the really famous uh, Tokyo Dome show, so this is in 94, where she wrestled Medusa for the WWE Women's Championship, and I believe she beat Medusa for the title, um, and Medusa ended up winning it back. Um, I was backstage um, before the match. I don't even remember what I was doing there. Um, but I, I think probably Fumi probably took me there, and she was just she was warming up, and I mean she was in so much pain, and then she went out there and had a a very good match. I mean, certainly not the best match on the show, but still a very good match. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, just, um, but just a, a awesome, awesome wrestler. All right. Jim Ross has uh, signed a new deal. It mm-hmm. appears to be a one-year deal. Yeah. Uh, he actually appeared to not know. He said, I think it's a one-year deal. But I hope, uh, I hope he knows. Said very lucrative. Thank Tony Khan. Well, well he's paid really well. Yes. You know, I mean, he makes he makes more money in AEW as an announcer than he ever made in WWE. You know, I mean, it, he got a it's a it's a great great deal. So um, there were some you know, I mean, some people thought maybe he wouldn't get signed. His deal ended on February fourteenth, but they signed him and presume he'll do big shows coming forward. I don't know if he's going to be. Um, Going weekly. I don't think he's going to go in weekly now. I mean, because he's got broken hip, and and you know, he only did that show you know on Sunday because you know he wanted to be there for that show. And there was a you know the poetic thing. He him and Tony Schiavone announced that the famous Flair Sting match in 1988. So it made sense to have them announce this match. It's really, um, you know, that show was a a big big success. It really was. Um, yeah, which is funny because, you know, look at the advances and everything like that. It's like, uh, you know, you you know, I mean, I watch I watch today and I thought like this this the amount of talent in AEW and the the matches that that are going to be held this year all year long and the stuff that's set up. I mean, they set up Omega and Okada, uh, but I don't know when it's going to happen. But they set that up tonight too, you know. So it's just like and they set up Brian Danielson and Will Ospreay, and it's just. Um, and then Pac is coming back, and Mercedes is coming in next week. And there are people on that roster, like Kyle Fletcher, that are just, these guys are, you know, 25 years old. Kyle Fletcher, man, this guy's, he, he could, you know, he, if he develops his personality at the level of his work, this guy's going to be one of the best wrestlers in the business because he's got the size, too. Well, we got to talk about this show, and uh, a lot happened. And it opened up with the, uh, I want to say one thing actually first. You were talking about uh, the pay-per-view being so awesome. And I thought they did a good job on this show with video packages. Like they recapped a lot of the stuff on the pay-per-view. But the one thing that I cannot understand is why did this show not have a Sting retirement ceremony? Don't ask me. There's a lot of stuff that I would have done. That, Do you remember when uh, Ric Flair and Shawn Michaels never, had that but, match but, at WrestleMania? But, but it was—I will say—it was never scheduled because they. Well, I know week, that, but my question is: last week they said they basically said last week that that was Sting's last last dynamite. Well, they said it was his last one before retirement. But they pushed it as like the last one. I know, but do you remember when Ric Flair and Shawn Michaels had that match? And you know. Yeah, Sorry, I love you, the, and then... The, the big ceremony the next day, which was one of the best segments ever on Raw. One of the on best Raw. shows ever. One I of mean, the best Raw segments ever, absolutely, yeah. I, I just have absolutely no idea why they did not announce Wednesday will be. Thank you, Sting. 
You know, the last 30 minutes of the show. Like, this, that probably would have done the biggest Dynamite number in a year. If they would have had the Sting retirement ceremony, it might have, who's going to be there and all that. Possible. And, uh, and he was just gone. No, just gone. I mean, whatever they were going to do, they were. I, I was told whatever they were doing, they were doing on Sunday. There's a lot of ideas, you know, that they could have done. And, um, you know, I guess I'm looking for some ideas to sell some damn tickets. <laughs> like, I'll tell you what I would. I tell you what I would have done was had a thing with um, had an interaction between Sting and Osprey, where Sting gave Osprey a speech, because it's like. You want to, you know, Sting's got credibility and you want to, you know, transfer generation to generation. It's like, I, I, you know, on that Wednesday, they should have probably done it on that Wednesday show, but they could have done it on Wednesday. They could have done the pay-per-view. They could have done it tonight. But, you know, I mean, Osprey's doing great in the ring on his own and the, the crowds are going crazy for him. But the Sting endorsement at the very end, you know what I mean? Do something like that. Um, you know, I mean, there's, there's ways to do it, but I mean, it's like, I, I just thought that that's like a given, you know, like Sting's, because it's not like he didn't put anybody over on the way out, even though he wanted to. And I will say, you know, Sting did want to lose that match, um, but that didn't happen. Um, but you can use your stardom to put somebody over, you know, um, verbally, you know, and give them the, you know, basically give them the rub that like you're the successor. Now take this company to the moon type of a speech it's easy and you know you know maybe he'll come back in three weeks and do it i don't know but uh i just thought that one was like a given you know an easy one so I showed up with a shivani calling swerve down to the ring and the point of this segment was this was the official swerve babyface turn and he talked about how when he was at the pay-per-view he promised he was going to win that title but he didn't and he promised two years ago, Revolution, he was going to win the title, and here he was with nothing. He said maybe it was karma for all the bad stuff he'd done, maybe payback. But he said, you know, at that uh, at that show, I heard you fans, and it was different. You sang, you chanted my name, you danced. It Haven't felt... they been doing that for a while? Well, yes, this is, this is the story, though. It yeah. felt, he said, like people really wanted me to win and make history. He said, I heard people flew all the oh, way oh. from Washington here. Okay, okay, that, 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 there's, that, that people would have gone crazy had he won, but I still felt that Joe was the mo- most popular of the three in the match. Well, I figured Joe was winning, just watching the storyline, yeah. but they are doing the rematch. He said that uh, he was coming for Samoa Joe in the title, promised to beat him for the title, and Joe then came down to the ring, and he said, you know, for a man who got beat the other day, you're talking funny, you're making promises you can't keep. And Swerve got angry, and he wanted to face him for the title tonight. But before uh, Joe could answer or anything could be signed, out came Adam Cole with the Undisputed Kingdom. And he said, everything we said we're going to do, the pay-per-view we did. Roderick Strong's a champion, international champion. Tabin and Bennett, greatest ring of honor tag team champions of all time. Swerve, six months from now, no one's going to be in, give a how, damn about you. How could Tabin and Bennett be the greatest of all time? Grace Ring of Honor Tag Team Champions of all time. No. Which is not true, by the way. But I mean, you had the Young Bucks and Briscoes held those titles. Yes. He says Wardlow's going to challenge for that AEW title, and he's going to bring it home. So, long story short, Swerve then challenges them to a tag team title match. And Cole said, well, you know, we'll do that next week. And Tony Schiavone then says, actually, I've just gotten word from Tony Khan that match is going to be right now. So it was Swerve and Samoa Joe versus Matt so, Taven and so, Mike so Bennett. Th- that's a total WWE move. You know that. Oh, yeah, of course. They've yeah. done that in a million shows. Yeah. The only thing missing was, uh, you know, Adam Pierce to say, it is official. Yeah. But anyway, this was a bad night for Ring of Honor champions because yeah. Matt Taven and Mike Bennett just got, I mean... I don't think it was such a bad night for Kyle Fletcher, even though he lost. Well, he lost, but I mean... I think it was actually the best night of his career. So uh, the story here is Samoa Joe's in there for a while. He's beating him up. And then Swerve blind tags himself in, does a total babyface comeback, every babyface high spot, and and wins. JML Driver, clean in the middle, beat the Ring of Honor Take Team Champions. Well, he had to win. And then Wardlow starts heading to the ring. And this is what I figure is going to happen. You ready for this? Okay. Swerve is beating Joe at the pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. He is going to remain champion... Until London? Until he is beaten by Adam Cole. Adam Cole? Yep. And then Adam Cole loses to Will, to, uh, Will Ospreay? 
Uh, very well could do that, yes. Well, okay. I think this well, will all depend on when Adam Cole when, returns. When, when can it, when, yeah, but how long before this, Adam this Cole could, can return? This could all change. I mean, I don't even know where Adam Cole's status... I, I mean, I know the injury has been slow healing, and I also feel that he's going to be in that wheelchair until he's 100% better, because when he's better, it's going to be a surprise. He's not going to let on when he is ready. But it has... This was... This is a very frustrating um, recovery for him, though. And then also doing Wardlow and uh, Samoa Joe next week. Yeah. So that's the uh, that's the they didn't they didn't they didn't advertise and yeah yeah and and Jay White and uh, Darby and um, tag team tournament matches and um, but yeah so they they announced a tag team tournament no brackets. Well, they they announced there's a tournament coming, but later it was not explained very well. But when Orange Cassidy and the best friends were asked if they were going to be in the tournament, and then Chuck Taylor says, I'm injured, you know, you two guys can do it, and it's going to start on Friday. I yeah. thought that meant the tournament started Friday. But they didn't did make it clear that's not a tournament match. Oh, it's not a tournament it's match. Not, I thought I, they, I'm, I'm 99% sure they said that's like, you know, that's going to be a pre-tournament match. Okay. So I don't think they have got the tournament officially announced in brackets or anything yet. Okay. I don't think that's a tournament match. Well, it's supposed to be March Madness, and March is, we're already, well, like, we, we well into March. We are seven days in, so. We are well into March now. Yes. So, uh, then we had, uh, he uh, hooked in a promo with Renee, and Chris Jericho showed up. And Jericho said, when I was first in ECW's Lionheart, I had my first match with your father. He dropped me on my head, never forgot it. But I have a connection with him, and I guess with you. And I didn't respect you until you dropped me on my head on Sunday. Maybe you're the real deal. Congratulations. Which played into an angle later. Yeah. Where well, they, Jericho, may be, they may be teaming up. Well, I think they are. But yeah. Because Jer- Jericho was... And, 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 you know, originally it was going to be the Jericho and Kenny Omega tag team. And obviously, you know, that fell through. And then it was going to be Jericho and, and Sammy Guevara tag team for the tournament. And Sammy Guevara suspended, which, by the way, we haven't. We, so, so, so we actually should probably talk about the Sammy Guevara suspension. Um, so it was on the February fourteenth show when he wrestled Jeff Hardy. So this is what I this, this is what I understand. This is what I don't understand. Okay, so when he did the Shooting Star Press, um, and he nailed Jeff Hardy with his knee right in Jeff Hardy's face and broke his nose, they came out and they told him. You know, because of concussion protocol, to finish the match, and he didn't finish the match, and he also did the GTH, which is a move where you need the guy in the head, which is exactly what if, and Jeff Jeff did not have a concussion; he only had a broken nose, but they didn't know that at the time. At the time, it was a you know suspected, so they were mad at at Guevara for not going right to the finish. So. Why? And I, I I get why he was suspended. I mean, I, I, I absolutely. If the, well, they, hold on, hold on. There is something here. Okay. Y- yes. I don't know what he was told. Okay. Mm-hmm. If I were doing the match, and something happened, and the referee said pin him, that mean that would mean something different to me than the referee saying take it home now. Mm-hmm. Take it home now could mean. Okay, we got to go right to our finishing sequence. Go work, go work to the finish. So yeah. I don't know what Sammy was told. So it's very possible he was just told pin him, in which case if he kept going, he should be suspended. If he was told in the heat of the moment, go to the finish, and so him and Jeff just figured, well, let's go to the finish. And that was the finish. And that was the finish. The GTH, I mean, was, the GTH was the plan. Yeah, finish. so I don't know what he was told. So there's a, there's a he might have gone well, against he, whatever. He, he, but he, that's he, not the issue, Dave. We know okay, what the issue but, is. Okay, but here's the thing. Okay. He was. He would not have been suspended if they didn't think it was clear. He wasn't suspended because somebody didn't like him. He was suspended because he. They felt that he violated something, and it's not just because at the spur of the moment he didn't. He didn't think things out and figure it out all on his own. That a guy who may have had a concussion probably shouldn't get another knee, which he shouldn't because in that situation. But the whole thing is, is that if the doctor believed that they needed to go to the finish. They should just stop the freaking match. And they could have stopped it on that freaking shooting star. Just go in there. Remember, they they backed him off, which I always hate. Because to me, it's like if someone's finished, if someone, you know, like in a, in a fight, when they, they stop the, when, when, you know, like they, if, if a guy, if the referee pulls a guy back and says he's hurt, you can't, you can't 
do it. The ma- means the match is over. So it should be the same way in the sense of if you're going to tell the guy he cannot attack, um, I guess they could wait because it is pro wrestling. And well, you like, go in to see if the guy's okay. Right. But here's the deal. If you've determined the guy's not okay, you, should just you don't say, well, just let's just take it home. Yeah. If he's okay to take it home, like, he's either done or he's not. If he's done, stop the match. If and it a, should not be placed on the wrestlers. No, that's exactly my point. It's like, that should be the doctor and the referee. And, and, and the doctor was right there. And if the doctor was concerned, should have just called it off right then and there. Yes. I mean, that's that. And I, I feel like, you know, like there's that, that squeamish thing where like we want to finish what we planned. And everyone has that in wrestling. Everyone, nobody wants to not finish the match as it's planned. People get pissed. Daniel Bryan nearly got in a fist fight with her. Brian Danielson nearly got in a fist fight with Levesque years ago because Levesque saw that he had messed up his arm and ordered the match stopped. Um, and, you know, Danielson, you know, which actually took away because that was going to be Danielson's big career first win over Randy Orton. And it ended up taking away. And he was furious at him for that. But and, and again, that was a shoulder problem. And, and a shoulder problem isn't as bad as a concussion problem. But if it's like the whole thing is you don't mess with the brain. And yeah, in this situation, the doctors just should have stopped the match. And it should not have been up to Sammy Guevara to take it home. And again, like what he was told, I mean, I guess whatever it was, the, the fact he did a GTH and nailed the guy with the knee after the, the, the concern of a concussion was one of the reasons why it went the way it did and he ended up suspended. So. Um, but anyway, yeah, so that was the deal with, um, the Jericho and Guevara team is now out the window. Um, so, so I guess it's going to be Jericho and Hook. A funny segment where they replayed the hangman attack on the referees and it was time for an update. And the update was, well, we don't know if there's going to be any fallout. And then five minutes later there was. There have been rumors, but they didn't tell us what the rumors were. Yeah. We might know more tonight. Or perhaps not. I was like, wow, that's a hell of a report right there. Yeah. Luckily, we did find out later. Uh, the Jacksons were about to make their announcement. They said they'd make it later. Then we had Hook and Brian Cage for the FTW title. And the idea here was to get Hook over to Tough Guy. So they had the FTW rules match, which anything goes. Cage ends up getting these thumbtacks, which he drops into the ring. And Hook jumps behind on a suplex and puts him in the red rum. And so to escape... Cage drops back and crushes Hook in the thumbtacks, but Hook does not let go. He keeps a hold on, and Cage goes out, so Hook wins. And then Bishop Khan and Toleon attack. Jericho ran down with the bat to make the save, so they're a team. They're a team, and they're probably going to face those guys maybe in the first round of the tournament. Yeah, we got a tournament here, so. Yeah, that could be the first first round tournament match, yeah. We had the uh, orange... Cassie segment which we talked about him and uh, Chuck will be going for the tag team titles. Trent's Trent still hurt. Trent, 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 Truck is still hurt. Chuck's Chuck's got a bad ankle. Yeah, not recovered. Kill switch squash daddy magic one sided match, and he goes to choke slam afterwards. But Daniel Garcia runs down to make the save. Nick hits the ring. Garcia's beating his ass, but Kill switch jumps him from behind, and he lays him out. And they go to leave, and suddenly who should return but Adam Copeland. And he throws Kill Switch off the ramp. He chokes out Nick. Shayna tries to do the low blow from behind, but he grabs the arm. Starts chasing Christian. Christian runs for his life, jumps in an SUV, steals the SUV. Yeah, and, he, uh, he threw through the driver. He carjacked the freaking yeah, car. Yeah, you can't do that, you know, but he did. And so then Copeland cuts he a promo. Should be, he, he should probably be suspended for that one, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, They suspend people for a lot less. In AEW, they still freaking Jungle Boy still hasn't even come back. He's still he that is, was six that was six months ago. Yeah, he was forced to join the House of Torture. I would too if I hadn't been called in six months. Yeah, jeez. So Copeland challenges him to an I Quit match March twentieth in Toronto, which yeah. I presume is for the title. Although he didn't say that. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't specify that. We'll see how this moves tickets because they at least have two weeks' notice in Toronto. Um, to buy tickets to, you know, <clears throat> this pretty big match featuring two people from, you know, Orangevale, Toronto, uh, to begin with. Kyle O'Reilly did a promo and he said, you know, I 
At one point thought I'd never get a, a chance to wrestle again, but I've gotten a second chance. It's very special. Love and respect the kingdom, but I've fallen so far down the mountain, I don't even know what path to take. He says, I got a second chance. I'm going to do it on my own. We had the Sting retirement video package. And then Shivani calls out Nick and Matt. And they come down to the ring and he goes, They boot him out. I want to congratulate you on such a great entrance after getting your asses kicked on Sunday. And they flip their lid. The crowd laughs. They kick him out of the ring. And then Nick grabs the mic. He says, you know what? Sting and Darby cheated. They brought all their friends from the retirement home. They're stupid six foot eight, 310-pound kids. <laughs> One of their kids. And uh, But, you know, he says, Matt made a great point. We ended Sting's career forever. And we are entering ourselves into the tag team tournament. Winning those belts back. And you know what's vanished, Dave? The rankings. That's right. Thank, I think, I think thank God. Away. Thank God. They went away already? Good. I, I mean, I, it's, it's fine with, I mean, it's fine by me if they went away. So Matt says we've got two announcements, which was funny because it was actually three. First announcement is, Hangman, after what you did, you have been suspended indefinitely from the elite. So we actually don't know if he's suspended from the... Uh, no, but he's suspended, he said suspended without pay. Yeah, from the elite. They specified from the elite. Yeah. That's their group. And then yeah. he goes, and now Kenny Omega, so does that mean, friend. So, so does that mean that, that Adam Page, when he comes back, he's going to be um, a babyface feuding with them? I don't know what any of this means right now. So I guess that's the impression I got from watching it, was that he was going to be... An yeah, I mean, if he comes Kyle. back as a babyface, yeah. I, my impression was going to come back as a babyface feuding with Okada. So uh, then Kenny has been uh, booted out of the elite. For not showing up for work. And he says... He's badly ill. We love you guys. We apologize if you had to find that out on live television, which you did. And item number two, he says, which was number three. We're very excited about this. And then Eddie Kingston storms down to the ring to interrupt. And he just grabs money, throws it at him, and he goes, you said I'd be fine if I talked shit about you, so you might as well take this money now. And they get a big brawl, and they lay him out, low blow, go for the EVP trigger, and suddenly the coin drops. Okada's New Japan music hits. Place goes nuts. He storms down to the ring. He stands beside Eddie. They're going to square off like a tag. But then he grabs him and hits him with the Rainmaker. And so we are getting grizzled, bitter asshole Okada. And I'm fine with that. And so Eddie versus well, the the idea is Okada is, for the Continental Crown. So the idea the idea is that if you remember when Okada first started with New Japan Pro Wrestling, he was a a cocky heel, you know, against Tanahashi for years until you know he just got so great that everybody cheered him. Like he never did a turn, but he started as a you know the idea of the rich pl- the rich playboy gimmick, you know, like a r- Japanese Ric Flair. Not exactly like Japanese Ric Flair, but but somewhat similar, and that's the gimmick he's starting with here too, is uh, the original, the the original portrayal of Okada that he first got over in like 2013 and 2012, 2013 in New Japan. We had Riho and Chris Statlander, which was a very good match, as all Riho match, matches are. I thought this match was excellent. It was you know what a what a. Rio is fantastic. I don't know why they don't do more with her. And she always gets over. Every <laughs> well, they are. She, she won this match. Yeah. She's yeah, going to she, get her semi-annual championship match coming up. Yeah, she, <clears throat> she's, she's, well, she may lose to Willow Nightingale, though, next week. She could, yeah. So uh, Stokely threw a chain into the ring. Statlander picked it up. The fans were chanting no. So she dropped it outside, hit two big suplexes, tried a third. Rio rolled her up and pinned her. And she was pissed afterwards, and she blamed Stokely, and Stokely was furious. I actually think this is leading to Statlander turning heel. Oh, I do too. That's my prediction here. Which could happen in that uh, Riho match with Willow, actually. What, her interfering to cost Riho the match? Yeah, could do. No, her interfering to cost Willow the match. Oh, yeah, it could be that. So then Riho would probably be facing Tony. But she, uh, she already faced Tony Storm, so maybe face Julia Hart? Could be Julia, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Julia Hart needs an opponent. I thought, but Willow was was uh, Willow was pushing the idea of her against Julia Hart. Well, that one's coming too, I'm sure. Uh, she, yeah, she's going after the TBS title. And we had uh, Tony. There could be Tony Awards with an I. She said, so we don't get sued. That's coming up on Collision on Saturday, 
and she gave Mariah a shirt, and Mariah was so happy. So Mariah is now dressed completely, sunglasses completely like the old Tony Storm, to the point that when she came out um, in the old Tony Storm outfit, it was like, whoa, Tony Storm changed her gimmick. But it was Mariah May. I mean, the hair was the same. Everything was the same. So they've got her now as like, you know, the duplicate Tony Storm. So then we had an interesting segment. So first, Darby comes down to the ring, and he said, you know, four or uh, five years ago, I was homeless 40 miles from here. Now I'm main eventing one of AEW's best pay-per-views of all time, Sting's retirement match. And what's next is I've got Jay White next week, and then the 27th, I'm flying to climb Mount Everest. And he says, to be honest, no guarantee I'm going to come back alive from Mount Everest. Just so this, wanted, may be, this 13th may be his last match. That's what he's saying. I just want to I do time. not. I, I, I'll tell you what. Like, like um, I respect him wanting to do it, but I have no idea why he's allowed to do it. Like, like if this was like a real sport, there was, you know, the contract would not allow this. They don't allow dangerous shit, you know. So And um, this one is quite dangerous. This is this is pretty high on the danger level, yeah. Yeah, I mean, climbing Mount Everest is no picnic. People do die. Most people don't die. Well, obviously, most people don't die. But people do die climbing Mount Everest. It's not unheard of. I think, um, you know, I think dozens of people have died doing it. I don't know the, the exact number, but it was. it's not an insignificant number. You want to look it up? I can look it up here in a second. Yeah. But uh, he, he laid the, the belt in the ring, and then Jay White comes down. And this was odd. Jay White basically said, you know, we don't have to do this match next week. He offered to just have Darby go backstage and party with them as Darby Scissorhands. And I was like, why does Jay White not want to face Darby? Like, what's happening here? And Darby said, you made a bit of... He he wants him to join the group. Why? Because Darby's a great wrestler. You would want a great wrestler in your group. All right. You try to establish a dominant group. Well, Darby didn't want anything to do with And Darby has nothing going on with Sting on. Whispered something that Jay said he'd see him at big business. I mean, it should be a great match. I'll tell you that yeah, much. Yeah, 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 yeah. Especially since it's Darby's last match for months. So he'll probably, like, break his body right before Mount Everest. That'll do, you know. If he didn't break his body on Sunday, I think he's going to survive a Jay White match. would be my guess. He'll survive a normal Jay White match, but he won't survive. He may not survive himself. It's never the match that's the problem. It's himself. I mean, Jay White is a, you know, it's not like Jay White is going to injure him, but Darby can injure himself. Ooh. What? 330 people have died. Yeah, it's not, a, it's not attempting an insignificant Attempting to number. reach or return from Mount Everest. Yeah, it's not an insignificant number, and most of those people had a lot more climbing experience than Darby. It says, uh, and this is also not good, uh, this from Outside Magazine, mm-hmm. climbers are dying on Mount Everest at an alarming rate. The 2023 death toll on Elbris, uh, Everest already reached double digits with multiple people still missing. That was last year. Yeah. So 2023 climbing season Everest has become a chaotic mess in recent days. Multiple reports of death, missing climbers, high altitude rescues. 500 people reached the summit in the last week. That's a lot of people went up there. No, a lot of people. A lot of people make it, but the, the 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 almost everyone who goes and climbs Mount Everest is a very very experienced climber. You know, Darby is uh, Darby is an inexperienced climber, but he did take to climbing at an at an incredibly fast pace because he's whatever he is. He's I mean, obviously Darby Allen is incredibly mentally strong, and that's one of the things you know when. When you're doing something like climbing Mount Everest, you got to be in your in physical shape, but you got to be mentally strong because something like that it's it's uncomfortable as hell. It takes months, and it's very easy to quit. You know, unless you just are not going to quit. I mean, a normal person's just a normal person without tons and tons of climbing experience is just they're just going to quit. You know. All right. right? So the average right. number of deaths per year is five, mm-hmm. and uh, and hundreds do make it to the top. Yes. Yeah. Most make it. Or not? I should say most make it, but but far more are going to make it than die. Yeah. And uh, in twenty twenty three, four Sherpas and six foreign climbers, foreign climbers. So uh, all the best to Darby. All the best to Darby. We had uh, House of Black promo, and then a Mark Briscoe promo, and essentially they're having a six person match. 
Street Fight. On Collision, Street Fight, it's Briscoe and Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett against the House of Black. And uh, throughout both promos, they kept talking about fire. I thought that they're going to end up with a, a ring surrounded by fire match. Well, they're they're definitely doing something involving fire. Yeah, that I is... mean that that was certainly a hint that I thought maybe maybe there's that's something they'll save for the pay per view. Those kind of matches shit can go wrong on, on those matches. I mean, I remember the one where the Sheik almost died. Um, you know, again, <coughs> I could I could I could, <coughs> excuse me, I could see AEW. Um, Doing a ring surrounded by fire match. I mean, WWE did it once. It wasn't that good. It wasn't that good. It's horrible. Yeah, Puerto Rico. You know, it's been done many times in Puerto Rico, and it's been done in Japan as well. So yes, the main event was uh, Will Osprey, Kyle Fletcher. Uh, they went about twenty minutes, extensive overrun. Thank God they put it up on YouTube. Seven minutes, and uh, they had an incredible match. Incredible one, match. The, 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 the scariest one, spot. One of the best matches in the history of that television show. The scariest spot by, I mean, Miles, was there up top, and Osprey gives him a reverse Frankensteiner, and I watched this thing over and over and over again. Kyle Fletcher landed, like, right on his head. I don't know how he survived. I mean, the ref dropped down to check on him, and apparently he was all right, but, I mean, he went... Right onto his head. Oh, scary! And uh, Will hit a hidden blade. They did a couple near falls, and then he goes for it again. And his former best friend Kyle just gets on his knees and begs him to hit it. And Will kills him, and that's the end of that. And uh, the show ended with Brian Danielson coming out for a Brian Danielson Will Osprey stare down. Yep. This pay per view. This pay per view. Oh my god. Pay per view's gonna be something. Um, there was a spot in this match, which was the one that ended with Will Ospreay's first Poison Rana. Unbelievable jaw-dropping stuff. Like, it was like three reverse, like, they were doing, you know, like, like everything, I don't know, just added steps. There was like three reversals of big moves, and somehow out of, out of all this, Will Ospreay hits this Poison Rana. And I mean, just, just ridiculous. He's, you know... So fast and so crisp. He needs to be the top baby face yesterday. Yeah, no, I know. Literally he, yesterday. Yesterday was dynamite. That's the day he should have been the top baby face. No, he literally he literally is like um you know, you know, like like they say the term generational talent, you know, MJF says it, lots of people say it, but he is actually it. He's actually really that guy. I mean I mean, honest to God, this guy it's like, I almost feel like, I think I said this before after the Takeshi to match, I almost feel like we need to have like new awards because it's like unfair to have awards with him in it because he's he's legitimately like as great as a lot of these guys are, like Danielson and and stuff. It's like he is, he's, I don't think I've ever seen a gap between number one and number two like like we have now. I mean, this guy is just like, like you know, even like an Okada or whatever like that. I mean, you know, who's great. I mean, it's like there's a big gap. This guy is just, he's playing a different game than everybody else. So that was the uh, Dynamite show. Lots of excellent stuff on that show. Oh, that was a great show overall. This is one of their better shows, yeah. And, I mean, the thing at the end was, is like when it was over, it's like there's some pretty cool stuff on Collision. But, yeah, I mean, you just look at 2024 is really going to be, at least in the ring, a hell of a year. Business-wise, we'll see. You know, I mean, you can have the greatest matches in the world. That doesn't mean your business is going to be the greatest in the world. But, um, yeah. Well, you know, I think what has been proven by all of these pay-per-views doing fantastic business is if you're going to put together a damn great match, advertise it in advance. Like, people will buy tickets to see great matches. People will buy tickets if to they see have the right these... If they still have to have the right well, story. Well, sure, but I mean... And they ha and more important, than not even the right story in the match, they have to be the right people in the right mix because... Well, of course, but the you, point you, is, you whatever can, you, you can, have, you announce be, it. You can be a great wrestler, and that does not make you a great draw. Well, no, it doesn't, but you know what? It, it, tell me what's on the damn show. Because Agreed. Agreed. There's, there's a lot of stuff when I watch this Dynamite where I think to myself, I did Observer Live at noon... I had no idea this match was taking place because they announced it after that, after 3 Eastern. 
And God damn, if I knew that match was on the show, I would have gone if it were local. Well, like I said, I know people in Atlanta who would have gone if they had known this card was going to be as good as it's going to be. I got an email about it like a couple of hours ago, actually, from somebody, if I can find it. He says, just some user feedback. Case it helps getting a local fan's perspective. I sat here waiting for AEW to give me a card that I would be willing to make the hour drive to attend. Since tickets and parking would have cost about forty dollars total, I was considering a purchase. That's not that. That's not that much. Well, he's saying I was considering a purchase, but the lack of announcements gave me a vibe. This wasn't going to be a must-see show. They seem to be putting together segments at the last minute. As much as I would have liked to have seen Osprey wrestle even at seventy-five percent healthy, or potentially the surprise debut of Okada, which, by the way, he wrote that before it happened. It isn't worth my well, time every, every, on a work but, night. I, I mean, I think I think I think everyone pretty much knew Okada was debuting tonight. Yeah. So. Get that damn card out. I think that's it. Well, I mean, they should have. They should have advertised Okada. They should have advertised Surprise. Although I, I do get the way they did it. If they had advertised Surprise, it kind of would have negated it to a degree. So I sort of get that. But there's no reason not to have just hit home hard, hard, hard. There's going to be a giant debut next week. Yeah. I mean, there's no. I, I can't come. And up they with didn't reason. even do that for next week. Actual what? Boston show. I know that's what I mean. No, I. For, for oh, you're talking about Okada for uh, doing that. I'm, last I'm, week I'm, I, 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 I get because of the way they did the introduction um, that it's almost like, well, we don't need to advertise it. We're doing it this way anyway, and it's like, you know, I mean, I would have certainly pushed. There's going to be a big surprise on the show because you're delivering Okada. It's not like you're not, you know, it's not like you're delivering, you know. Um, Sean Spears, you know what I'm saying? You know, someone who are, oh, yeah, we get this big surprise and ends up being a letdown. Like, this is not, you know, this is not a letdown. And and Mercedes is not a letdown either. I mean, I mean, they should have, you know, pushed it like, you know, next week's show is going to have one of the biggest debuts in the history of the company. Because that is one of the biggest debuts in the history of the company. Instead, we just got, you know, some matches. Um, so, anyway. But... I will say this too, you know the um, the booking on this show tonight was really freaking good. I mean, they set up not just stuff for they said they, they they have a lot of masters. They set up stuff for next week. They set up stuff for the pay per view, and they set up stuff for months from now. You know, I mean, like they basically, you know that that angle with Daniel with um with um Okada replacing Kenny Omega in the Elite. It is to lead to Omega and Okada. So if when Omega gets healthy, and that may not be soon, the fact is is that this match is already there for the taking. You know, we already have the angle. So, you know, for whenever they can do it. And I could see um, Omega was advertised for Toronto, so he may be on TV as soon as two weeks from now. Not Obviously not wrestling anytime soon. But, um, you know, so we could be getting something. But, yeah, like... Um, you know, it could be Omega and Okada at Wembley this year, which would be a a, a giant match go, along with, you know, Will going for the championship against whoever the champion is. Um, that that Wembley is going to be Wembley is probably going to be a bigger card than last year. Not draws but good, but a bigger card as far as great matches. Because look, Pack will be back. Jamie Hader will be back. You know what I mean? Hopefully, anyway. All right, so uh, just a couple of notes from NXT. We don't have time for the full review, but the title matches. We had the Chase U versus Braun Breaker and Baron Corbin. They had a pretty good match. Had a lot of heat. Yeah, a lot of heat. And Chase sent Braun into the steps and hit a high cross on Baron. The place was just going crazy. But then Braun got a blind tag. Baron hit Chase with a deep six. Braun speared him and pinned him. It was a very good match. And uh, Chasey was very upset afterwards, and Thea stormed out, and did an angle afterwards with uh, with her. They're trying to save her relationship with old Riley Osborne. Those of you mm. following that storyline, yeah, but but freaking Blair Davenport looks like she wants to get in the middle of it, and she's she got sure an does. edge. She's actually engaged to the guy. Yeah, you know what's funny is they had a, they had quite a line in that segment where uh, you know Blair goes up to Thea and she goes. He's not even your type. And nobody asked a question, like, how would Blair Davenport know that? But I think that line was said for a reason. She's engaged to him. I know. She's going to break Thea's heart and storylines what's going to happen here. Yeah. So uh, then we had the uh, the women's tag team titles run the line 
with uh, Lyra and Tatum versus Oscar and Kyrie. I must say that that as bad as that um, Tatum Paxley stuff has been in previous weeks, I actually thought that interview with Lyra Valkyrie was her low point. I thought that was just unbelievably bad. It was, well, well, well I, I can recap that here, if I must. So they're backstage, and they're talking about the match, and Lyra's like, you know, let's do this tonight. We'll be tag team champions. And Tatum says, we'll be more than friends. And Lyra's like, eh, I don't know about that. We're not even really friends, but they're an amazing team, so we got to do our best. And uh, Tatum says, I'll do anything to win tonight. And I actually wrote down, Dave, word for word what she said. She said, when I become champion, I am going to journey to the farthest darkness and I'm going to conjure up the most diabolical thoughts of torture. And I'm going to reach into my opponent's body. And I'm going to take out their soul until they are crying and screaming in complete agony. And Lyra's like, what the fuck are you talking about here? And then she goes, are you going to do that for me or for the titles? I was like, that's your response? Are you going to do it for me or the titles? So we do the match. And you know what Tatum didn't do? Anything to win. <laughs> they just had a match. It was... Kind of there. It was all right, I guess. And then they uh, pin Tatum with their finish. <laughs> like, that was it. And then Roxanne showed up and attacked Lyra and destroyed her arm. And uh, they stretchered her out. And they sold it like her arm was broken. Hmm. So I guess uh, Tatum's going to have to get revenge on Roxanne. Good luck with that. So anyway, the other, uh, the other notable thing on the show was uh, they did the main event, which was Carmelo and Tony D., number one contenders match and they're going back and forth and there's like no heat for this match it's like really quiet and then suddenly they hit tricks music and man they hit that guy's music and this place went absolutely crazy and he didn't come out but carmelo was distracted tony pins him it is tony versus Elia over wrestlemania weekend and then tony cuts a promo and says sorry about that whole uh Stunt I pulled, but you know what? I'm a giving Don, so Carmelo, I got a present for you. And they hit Trick's music again, and he actually shows up this time. And he's beating up Mello, and man, this guy is so over. He's like the most over guy in this show by multiples. Yeah. Like. He's super, super charismatic. He, he, I, I mean. Why are he, they doing he, this? Doing what? Why is it not Trick versus Mellow for the title at Mania Weekend? I have no idea. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. I think the idea is they can do Trick against Mellow and then uh, Tony against uh, Ilya for the championship. Well, that's clearly what they're doing, but why? <laughs> because they think that they'll What's the big match that everybody in this company wants to see? They want to see Trick it's Williams win the championship. It's not a mystery. The cha- they want to see Trick Williams win the championship. Yes. That's what they want to see. From Mellow. From Mello, better. Be. I mean, it'd be fine if it's from Elia. It'd be was... fine, but I mean, ultimately, it would be best if he beat Mello for the title. A hundred percent. Like that's the story they've been doing for uh-huh. years. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. They um, completely agree. There's timing for everything, and this was the timing. And they're going to delay his championship win. You know, and maybe you know he'll, he'll be fine. He's got so much charisma, he'll be fine. But yeah, should have been should have been on that show. All right, take us through these uh, collision spoilers. Um, Rampage. There's Rampage. Collision is tomorrow. Yeah. So um, Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta beat um, Kip Sabian and The Butcher when um, Beretta pinned uh, The Butcher with the strong zero. And then uh, Julia Hart uh, beat Robin Renegade. I think this was a championship match um, to retain the... uh, TBS Championship, and then uh, Penta beat Action Andretti, and Top Flight beat one three way over Commander and Brian Keith and Private Party. Also, should mention Teton making his AEW debut on Saturday against Chris Jericho, which is a weird match, you know. But um, Teton is actually. Um, Probably of of all the guys in CMLL, I would say Teton is the best wrestler because Mosca Dorada is the most impressive flyer, but he's still green in a lot of ways. But Teton is like still a great flyer, 
but he is he's just great overall. I mean, he was a killer in the New Japan Cup, and I mean he he's another one of those guys. I mean, God put him with Brian Danielson, Will Ospreay, you know, a million guys on this roster, and Teton will have absolute killer matches with them. And I believe also this weekend is UFC 299. Yeah, Sugar Sugar uh, Sean O'Malley against Marlon uh, Vera. Marlon Chito Vera. Marlon Chito Vera beat Sean O'Malley. It was uh, he injured him with leg kicks and and uh, the ref stopped it. But Marlon Vera was doing really well in that fight. You know, I mean, it was a short fight, but he was doing really well before. Um, you know, it, you know. You know, so it wasn't like it was like a fluke injury and he lost. I mean, he was he was losing the fight. It was only one round. Um, O'Malley has definitely improved since then. Uh, but yeah, I, I find it an interesting match. So um, yeah, big pay per view, um, big pay per view, and uh, probably uh, probably big TV rating because UFC TV ratings for the pay per view prelims have been pretty strong of late. All right, everybody. In that note, we're going to wrap it up for today. New Observer is up on the front page right now. The back issue is up. We've got some members-only exclusives up there you can check out as well. And uh, lots of shows up over the last couple of days covering all the news, so check those out. And that is it, everybody. We'll talk.